Coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. Data is put into a system, in this case our system, that curates it, which means we, we take the data that, like I said, was generated for another reason. We essentially kind of take the data and apply a whole bunch of information to the data that allows it to be indexed. They say data is the new oil. Well, if that's the case, then like oil, crude data must be refined and packaged to make it useful and consumable. If you believe, like I believe, that all incremental value from an internet product comes from transforming its data into useful information, then external sources of data when combined with internal data can become very valuable indeed. In this episode of the IoT Business Show, I speak with Dave Knight about third-party data markets and syndicates. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is made possible by sales of my book, IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, and the IoT Inc. Certified IoT Professional, or ICIP, online training and certification program. Become a certified IoT professional by completing the program's three courses, ICIP Technology, ICIP Business, and ICIP Strategy and Digital Transformation. Details of which can be found at www.iot-inc.com. That's www.iot-inc.com. With me today on the IoT Show is David Knight. David is founder and CEO, CTO of Turbine, a commercial marketplace for data. He's a serial entrepreneur with a background in multispectral sensing, messaging, enterprise software, and distributed systems, and was an original executive of the Ansari X Prize for private space travel. David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So you seem to be a bit of a space buff. What's the story? (laughs) I am a a devout and acknowledged space buff and proud of it. (laughs) Um, Card carrying. Card carrying. Uh, Well, the... Quick version of it is that um, my background is in applied physics, uh, specialties in wave theory and laser optics, and um, I've always been fascinated by the space industry, but I did not end up working for NASA when I first came out of school. I did other things, and then uh, in 2004, I purely as an act of uh, passion for the new space industry that was building, I joined a thing called the X Prize, as you mentioned. Yeah, Um, right. Originally called the Ansari X Prize, thanks to a very generous donation by the Ansari family, who, by the way, made their money by inventing the original equipment that tied old telephone systems to the internet packet base systems. And they sold that company for a huge amount of money and were mm-hmm. able to do things like fund private spaceflight. And it's nice. They're the unsung heroes. Everybody knows Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, Paul Allen. Richard Branson, but the Ansaris were there really at the beginning of this. I was uh, the first VP of business development for the XPRIZE Foundation, and in 2004, we saw Pert Rutan launch to space, the very first private spacecraft. Um, So I spent a bunch of time in that industry, actually, and, you know, hung out with Elon Musk and people like that. It was really exciting. Um, and, and, and astronauts, I'm assuming? I actually have friends who are astronauts now. All right. Wait, you, you, you're talking in past tense. What happened? Uh, well, about uh, 2011, you know, the space shuttle program wrapped up. Right. And at the same time, they decided what to do with the last three shuttles. So the shuttle Discovery went to the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum Annex at uh, Dulles Airport. The shuttle Atlantis went to uh, a brand new visitor center that they remade down at uh, Kennedy Space Center. That left one shuttle because, of course, we sadly lost Columbia and Challenger. Sure. So the shuttle Endeavor was up for grabs, and after a very fierce competition, it was given to the West Coast at the Cal- right. California Science Center. 
And I kind of rolled up my sleeves and my pant legs and got in the mud and said, I'm going to help do this. And it was a nonprofit activity where we had to bring the shuttle to California, fly it all over the place on a 747, bring it into LAX, bring it through the streets in a huge robot that weighed a half. I remember that. I remember that. You had to take down like lamp posts and oh, my God. power power lines. and so Yes. On, right? uh, as a matter of fact, uh, part of my donation to it is we created a fairly large scale film crew documented the whole thing we had uh, just my crew was about 150 people Jeez. And i had uh, helicopters plural and and all sorts of cool stuff uh <laughs> loaned to me by hollywood including uh, some be- very big name producers were very generous and excited mm-hmm. about it nice and we did that in, at the end of 2012 and put it in a uh, its new home next to the la coliseum and the film about that, by the way, is called Three Nights, comma, Three Days. That's because that's how long it took. And we donated okay. the movie to public television. And you can see it on Dish Network or Direct TV. It's totally free. And uh, we put it there as a fundraiser for public television and to get young people excited about the space industry. Mm-hmm. And now right after that, uh, we're kind of involved with that. There was sort of a long tail so to speak, (laughs) of the shuttle project, which, by the way, has a 57-foot tail. And uh, (laughs) we it was ensconced in its new home, and while we prepared to build a new air and space center for the western U.S. to house it uh, vertically, like it's in takeoff position, I started fishing around uh, for my next tech startup. And uh, I got a bunch of interns from UC Berkeley, very brilliant kids from a variety of disciplines. We called this the Turbine Project, T-E-R-B-I-N-E, mm-hmm. just to have a distinctive spelling. We weren't going to make wind turbines or jet turbines. And we literally looked all over the place. We said there was no holds barred. Maybe we're going to make spaceships. Maybe we're going to make satellites. Maybe we're going to make... Uh... <laughs> well, you started with a name and you went from there? yes. Yes, it's a very unusual and luxurious thing to do. Very unusual, this very is correct. Unusual. We actually had no particular idea. Uh, very cool and rare thing to do. I've never been able to, had the luxury of doing that before. And we said, well, we could do anything. Maybe we're going to make disposable cups for uh, third world countries. I don't know. When we got done, we kept coming back to this central theme that the Internet of Things, so named, was going to be bigger and bigger and bigger and if you follow the track of Moore's Law, which, of course, mm-hmm. has helped we all do 40 years, uh, I think, uh, we're just going to see Moore's Law not only applied to the processor itself, but to memory, mass storage, and very interestingly, bandwidth, and by way of connectivity, so to speak, the sensors themselves, better, faster, smarter, cheaper, smaller. We decided that we we're going to focus on the Internet of Things But uh, part of our group kept saying, you know, there's going to be a new thing where data becomes a commodity that's traded in the same way that data is used to cause goods and services to be moved now. And early evidence of that was, you know, Uber, where some data causes a machine to come magically in front of your feet and you get to get in it and go somewhere. And... By kind of snapping all that together, we decided, why don't we build a data marketplace for, <laughs> for the Internet of Things? Why not? And then, why not? Then we, <laughs> then we, what else we got to do? Very right? deep I mean... and realized that uh, nobody was really building that or talking about that. And yet that's exactly what things, you know, Facebook, Google, those kind of mega systems, all of them have in common is that they sell the data for use in analytics. And of course, okay, it's, yeah. it's really mm-hmm. huge, huge numbers. We also looked at uh, the venerable Bloomberg and realized that Bloomberg did exactly that for the financial industry and, and of course, you know, became a huge company uh, to this day. So kind of snapping all that together and how did Jeff Bezos build Amazon, who, by the way, is also building spaceships now. Very cool. Yes, he is. Uh, Blue Horizon. And Blue Horizon. Uh, how did Google get built for real, you know, and... Amazon is not the only example. eBay is another excellent example of a marketplace. Um, but, but pretend it's 100% data. And that rolled up to what we're now simply calling Turbine. And uh, it's it's been a quite a journey. Um, 
not to riff too much on the company, but right now we've uh, we've gone into pilot testing after quite a lot of code development, and it's uh, really exciting to start putting data in it. So now is this, uh, I mean, I've heard of the concept of syndicated data. Um, clarify what that means and does it apply here? Well, it does uh, in a way. Um, the short version, I guess, would be that, uh, you know, in the consumer world, they call it data exhaust which is mm. really funny to apply when you're talking about things like autonomous vehicles and ships. But <laughs> yes. um, let's go for it. Um, many, many things that are generating data now, we're obviously doing it for some reason. And so nobody puts a sensor out there just for fun, except for maybe Weather Underground or something like that, some crowdsource thing. So you put the data sensor out there for some reason, might be your oil and gas pipeline or your ship at sea or what have you. Well, that primary purpose usually means that after you've used the data, it just gets put into a storage system somewhere or gets discarded. In some cases, right. it's discarded after milliseconds. So our postulate is that much as weirdly has happened first in the consumer world, usually it's the other way around. What if the industrial world and every part of the commercial world and the governmental worlds to take the data they generated for that other reason and find a frictionless way to get it to other third parties. So an example would be, uh, you know, let's say uh, an autonomous vehicle is cruising down the streets and uh, it's got sensors bristling with sensors. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. obviously used to guide the vehicle. But what if some of that information could be used by the city it's traveling through to tell you, you know what, there's, there's a, a hole in the street there there's a pothole and i can tell because all the cars are slamming on their brakes and turning around something and mm -hmm. we don't have a traffic cam in the middle of somebody's residential street so we're going to send a guy out in a truck to look at it but you don't have to send guys out in trucks all the time looking at all the streets you just you know get this data that's fed in there another example would be uh you know wellhead monitoring for god forbid fracking um but fracking is very productive, but fracking mm. has also created a lot of issues where they have to report on groundwater issues and, and you know, all that kind of stuff that comes with it. The oil companies are really dealing with the fact right now that they have to report to every township, every municipality, county, state, governments, and other countries. And mm. wouldn't it be cool if they could just put that data into a system and let those guys, those governmental entities, just tap into it? And then they don't have to hire a bunch of people just to get the data to them. So all of these issues kind of amalgamate to the idea of a frictionless way to get the data out there. But the other problem you have to solve, which is really important in the Internet of Things, is that a lot of companies consider that their, you know, their family jewels. And so yeah. because of that, we've had to put a pretty hefty amount of energy into trying to figure out how to curate the data in a way that they can trust. And even though I like to say we're sort of building the Amazon or the eBay or the Bloomberg, depending on who I'm talking to for, mm -hmm. for sensor data, the truth is we're building Switzerland for data because we have to be, you know, we're the small country in the middle, but we have really cool lakes and we can yodel. And um, the problem is that, uh, you know, what do we have to do to engender that trust so a huge company feels comfortable giving us data they've never shared before? Right. And yet right. it's crossing industry sectors and cross correlative analyses that makes this really interesting. Well, David, before we get into the yeah, you know, the intricacies, um, I want to talk about the concept. So the concept you've you've drawn a couple of analogies now, and that is a marketplace for data. And uh, I want to go back to the um, <clears throat> to the syndicated component of it. Is it syndicated data? Is that is that the definition, or is it is it something different? I guess I wouldn't call it syndicated per se. Um, it's really where um, data is put into a system, in this case our system, that curates it, which means we, we take the data mm -hmm. that, like I said, was generated for another reason. We essentially kind of take the data and apply a whole bunch of information to the data right. that allows it to be indexed. Um, metadata. You're, you're metadata. adding metadata to the data? Very rich. 
metadata layer, which I can talk about in a minute. It's really interesting. Designing a real metadata spec for the Internet of Things has been quite a journey. But uh, we've, yeah, I guess in some cases you would call it data syndication. Um, the reason I hesitate on the word, because we have mulled that over in the past, is syndication often implies in other realms that once it's left, you have no control over it. Um, whereas in our case, we've put a, a lot of effort into making sure that the provider of the data has an amazing amount of control over even who gets it. And that's what that metadata helps to do is to essentially uh, credential and validate both sides mm -hmm. um, with a lot of resolution. And so in that regard, it's sort of like PayPal. You know, it's a pain to set up PayPal, but once you've set it up, you're happy because now everybody knows what everybody else is doing with the money. And uh, it's a one-time act. And uh, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but the technology we're experimenting with right now to credential both sides and actually facilitate a smart contract between both sides is blockchain. Yes. Not Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of those things, uh, but the blockchain itself. And sure. it's really been interesting to look at using blockchain for something nobody has done with it before. I've, I've been ta talking to the actual people that write all the books about blockchain just to get advice because it, it's really at the leading edge of where blockchain is going. Well, I'm dying to talk about blockchain. In fact, I just came back from a conference and there were a number of very interesting um, presentations on blockchain, on Bitcoin and Ethereum, as you, were, as you were mentioning. But I want to get into the buyers and the sellers of this data. So let's start with the buyers. So who is, who's using this data and what are some of the applications that you've seen you know, from these users? So we uh, just started doing pilot testing and uh, which isn't exactly the question you asked. So pilot testing in this context means that the system is now uh, open for operation and it's a uh, pretty complex backend using multiple different database types and the metadata works and the indices work. And we're not calling it beta till we flip the switch that turns the money part on and then it'll be <laughs> okay. uh, real deal beta. So, uh, so you're going to call it beta so you have still a little bit, so a few outs if you need them, right? When exactly right, them. yeah. Um, unlike some very large Silicon Valley companies, we don't just beta test it on the actual customers. Um, we, we think this is too serious to do that. And so... Uh, and we're talking, just, just for everyone listening, we're talking September 2016 right now. September 2016, and we are in pilot testing. Um, so let me tell you about that. The system... Turbine is, again, very complex, uses quite a lot of different database constructs, and uh, all of that is open source on the back end, which is, makes it uh, very palatable to lots of big companies, by the way, as mm -hmm. blockchain. So what's happening right now is we're filling the system with what are essentially publicly available data sets. And, oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, and it's really interesting. So uh, for all of those listening... Um, you may have had this experience where you go try to find something like, uh, I don't know, ocean surface temperatures are easy, but maybe it's harder to find in some lake or river, um, or you're trying to find something about the movement of sea containers or whatever, you know, and it turns out the panoply of um, sensor types, and then within each, the you have to know things like what's the sensor and, and all that, and does it get calibrated, can I trust these readings? Finding all that out is really complex and very time-consuming, and very little sensor data is just cruising on the surface of Google. Um, mm -hmm. I've actually discouraged people from suggesting we're building Google for the Internet of Things, as sexy as that is, and no, we're not the Uber either. Um, we really think that uh, it's more like a Bloomberg meets you know, mm -hmm. eBay or Amazon, and the reason mm -hmm. is that it's not the obvious stuff. So fun analogy sailing it to Northern Californians is, you know, when uh, I think it was, uh, maybe it was Sutter found gold glinting at him in a stream and he said, Oh my God, there's gold in them, their hills. Or mm -hmm. actually I think that was Alaska. Mm -hmm. He says, wow, there's gold. I see it right there in the stream. Well, there's a lot of that sensor data that's on the surface or, you know, just below the surface of the stream. But the real gold is, you know, in the ground, which means you got to get some guys and some gear and dig a hole. And right. 
we've actually right this minute have a fleet of very smart interns digging around <laughs> for sensor gold. And they are deliberately not computer science students. They're actually physical sciences and engineering, like mechanical engineering, uh, applied physics, and so on. Because so we need to understand the domain. We, well, we needed them to know what a sensor is and what the, uh, you know, right. if I said it's barometric pressure or foot pounds of torque on the drive shaft of a ship, they've got to know what that means. They then uh, kind of throw the fish in the boat, and then we have other smart computer science types who clean them and cook them. <laughs> And right. right now we have a backlog of many thousands of sensor data sets. It'll eventually be millions. And there are everything, if you went to go look at turbine.io, which is a front end we built to show you what the back end does, it actually uses our API. It's, uh, this is not a consumer thing, but we had to build a front end. And the front end has, for example, on one end of the spectrum, uh, surface radiation data from the Fukushima reactor incident mm -hmm. on the other end of the spectrum we have bicycle counters for the center part of london and okay always a hot topic yeah and maybe they have something to do with each other so we decided <clears throat> excuse me to have a deliberate very broad range to kind of open people's minds and and have them think wow there is a lot of different types of sensor data out there and maybe even come up with new uses by cross-correlating them and doing analytics so the way it's working right now is we're throwing all this publicly available sensor data into the system. By the way, this is exactly what Michael Bloomberg did at the beginning of his company, uh, mm -hmm. just or Climate Corp. Uh, just go out there and find what's out there. Not trivial. Package it. Yeah, package it is the hard part. So right. um, the metadata construct that we have, uh, we've really run this by quite a lot of people. You, you can actually see it on our website. We just made it out there. And the specification took a huge amount of time to work on, and that's because nobody built a metadata spec for the Internet of Things that took into account all these tough issues like policies, uh, regulatory issues, which could include border crossing of data, who owns what, maybe there's some privacy angles, and get all of that without making the spec too bloated. Uh, and I've co-chaired uh, specification standards committees in the past in other realms, and you know, it's kind of a dance to make it usable uh, so that even little guys, one or two person startups or colleges can use it, but all the way that it's rich and deep enough that it makes big organizations happy. So, but, but wait a second. You said you were trying not to make it bloated. Are you kidding me? You're saying all data. So you're trying to come up with a metadata, meta uh, I guess a metadata vocabulary <laughs> or metadata uh, dictionary for all things, is that what you're saying? No, it's uh, it's for sensor data only. So it's um, descriptive of you know what kind of sensor is this. Um, it has really neat notions that we think will be important. Most people aren't talking about them yet. Uh, for example, a thing we call the nested chain of provenance. That's what I call it. The spec has a technical name for it. So, give you an example. Um, let's say I make a jet engine bristling with processors and sensors, spinning off tons of data literally every minute. So who owns that data? Does the engine manufacturer own that data? Or does it sitting on a pylon attached to, you know, an Airbus or a Boeing, do they own the data? Or does the airline own the data? Or mm -hmm. does the leasing company that owns the paper on all of that own the data? And there's a very well-publicized case about a year ago where John Deere had that exact thing come up because you're buying a million-dollar combine or a half-million-dollar seed planting or seed uh, injection machine. So just the sheer cost of that thing makes you pay a lot of attention to the user agreement, which is kind of like an Apple iPhone user agreement. And <laughs> yeah. buried in that language, it says, oh, we have the data. And um, right. Right. the controversy, of course, came when some big customers said, wait a minute, John Deere owns this data, and that controversy is swirling around the commercial world in a way that it never has before. And of course, we all just, you know, on the iPhone or an Android phone or on a Mac or a PC, we just go, yes, yes, yes. I, I, we I, give it all away. I, yeah. I, I, I click yes. I don't read the 60 page no, 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 user no. agreement. And I did just give it all away. That's happening with new cars. 
because they have built in data transceivers. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a big controversy over who owns the data from your individual car or who even owns the data from your Fitbit. So we decided to get in front of all that by just having the idea of provenance, not only from an ownership standpoint, but potentially a nested chain of provenance okay. where okay. we could include the engine, the, the aircraft, the airline, and the leaseholder all at once in that metadata spec. So it's in there. To sidestep. I mean, you put it all in there and you can sidestep the ownership issue. Yeah. And uh, even with this public data we're putting in right now, I mean, it's lovely because you don't have to deal with almost any of that. But a lot of these places we're finding the data have these little usage terms. And it says, if you use this data, you need to say it came from the University of 123. So we put that in the metadata so that if somebody goes to pull mm -hmm. that data out of the system, they actually know these are the rules of the road. Now, we are if you will, the exchange and not the individual brokerage, which means that we're not there to literally enforce that, but we realize that we should make that information available and easy to get at so that whoever's taking the data out knows what the rules are. Now, uh, the next part of the problem is how do you deal with very, very large data sets? And well, before you go there, though, I, I want to go back to, to my question in terms of the buyers and the sellers. So you kind of gave a bit of a hint there when you said, well, a buyer may take a couple disparate data sets and run some analytics and try to create some value. I, I, you didn't say that part, but I'm assuming that's why they create the, that's why they would use the analytics. But just before we get, before we get into down and dirty and some of the details, who are you seeing as your users and what are they doing with the data? Yeah. So, uh, the initial use cases are really just this matter of uh, if you make it easy to get at, people will pay for that. Um, it's that mm -hmm. removal of friction. I mean, we could do everything that Uber does, but can you imagine trying to find a guy who has some time on his hands with a car and is going to drive you somewhere and you're going to pay him? Seems like that would be a pain. Um, but you could have done that 30 years ago. But now you magically hit a button and it just comes to right where you're standing and takes you where you want to go and builds your credit card. So that removal of friction or how Amazon makes it incredibly easy to buy millions and millions of items um, you know, are great examples of why friction reduction is so valuable. So, But in that case, you're reducing friction for a function, the function being to go from A to B. Here you're reducing friction for what function? Right. So we're reducing friction and literally finding that data and also getting your hands on that data. So... Another analogy would be, you know, the world of Napster versus the world of iTunes. So in the world of Napster, you could find things. It was not convenient. There was no uniform way that the songs or movies or what have you were described. Uh, in fact, they were even obfuscated sometimes in the title to, so the guy putting them out there wouldn't get in trouble. And unfortunately, with sensor data, the range of issues and variables are so high that, you know, having uniformity would be a big thing all by itself. And then the next issue is... Uh, you know, is it okay to get my hands on this data? And so by being the curator, there's that sort of uh, implicit and with corporate data explicit, you know, promise that you're, you're fine. As long as you follow our, the rules we've given to you, you're fine using this data. Nobody's going to come after you. And we really think that a lot of people, probably the parents of a lot of teenagers said, you know, I know it's a dollar a song instead of free, but I know the mm -hmm. FBI isn't going to break down our door in the middle of the night. So, I, <laughs> okay. and, and they removed the friction. They made it incredibly easy to just go click, bang, you know, right. and you get the, the iTunes song or whatever. So um, I don't want to flood too many analogies. Out there, but You're doing a pretty good job so far. It is kind of like that. And so you, but still, just, but still, David, I'm trying to understand. All right. You reduced the friction. Yep. Um, they feel safe in having it. What are they doing with it? So the very first use cases are really interesting. Um, you know, for uh, let me think of a couple. A lot of the companies that are working with us on the pilot tests are are great names. We you know we're under non disclosure uh, sure. until we announce them. <clears throat> I'll give you two broad use cases that are starting to bubble up pretty quickly, even though we're, just, mm -hmm. we're still just in pilot test very recently. Uh, one is the uh, automotive industry, okay, and um, 
we like them because uh, autonomous vehicles couldn't be a hotter topic. Uh, I'm certainly in the fairly large camp that says autonomous vehicles are inevitable. Um, it's yeah, you know, we can debate forever when they're the critical mass, and there's so many of them that all the cars go faster, and there's no more accidents. You know, it's probably very far out in the future. But initially, we're seeing um, trucks, buses. Is in terms of um, really cool use cases, the idea that vehicles could use data that comes from other sources as a way to aid their navigation is really interesting. So if you take your own experience of driving a vehicle, you realize you're actually taking in a lot of stuff that isn't just you know the instrumentation cluster on the car. There's all sorts of other things you've got to deal with. Now, if you could have this almost magical knowledge of what's happening way out in front of you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we call the environmental data, like, um, you know what, there's a fire hydrant blowing out on this street of Manhattan that just happened. Um, wouldn't it be useful if your car said, hmm, better not go down that street right now, or they're trimming trees, you know, or mm -hmm. gosh, any number of issues. Uh, or very interesting things like, we know that on this next three blocks, there's this many parking spots available. Um, and so bringing all that into a common mode interface that can be tapped by a machine is, you know, potentially very useful. Hmm. And one thing I probably failed in mentioning early on is that we don't see turbine or most of these data marketplaces in other realms that are coming up being something that humans type at and look at. They're all accessed through application programmatic interfaces, APIs, in a real fire hose fashion so that uh, it's really a machine making the inquiry at very high speeds. And that, that's part of the secret of the metadata is you had to put everything into these uniform modalities so that through an API that could be rapidly tapped into and indexed. So the car thing is really interesting. Eventually the cars themselves will be able to spit out data that we can put in the system that could be used by other entities like the city it's traveling through or um, mm -hmm. some other mm -hmm. really, there's one use case that's very sexy where uh, scanning data coming from the car could be used to tell you about the canopy of the street you're going down, literally trees that are overhanging, catenary wires for things like municipal buses and trains. Interesting, interesting. Now, who could use that data? Well, of course, you could tell the local city, you know what, those trees are getting too big, send the dudes out to cut them. Uh, mm -hmm. instead of sending the dudes out just to decide what to cut, just, it's automatic or there's a mm -hmm. pothole or something's in the street. But the really sexy use case is, Hmm, if I knew exactly the constantly changing conditions between these skyscrapers on this street, I could fly a drone down that street and deliver a package. Now, mm -hmm. things like Google street view don't go down that street very often, but a whole bunch of autonomous cars, now you've got a continually updating picture of what's happening on all the streets at all altitudes, the street itself all the way up to, you know, 50 feet, 100 feet in the sky. So that's a really <laughs> cool, cool Internet of Things application that we haven't even that's, – that's going to happen. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, when and in what cities first. The other yeah, case, no, that is cool. Yeah. The other use case, which is uh, also sexy, is uh, this – thing coming at us like a giant train, which is the world of augmented reality and virtual reality. Right. So virtual reality has been coming at us like an augment, like a, like a freight train for at least 25 years. Yes. But I happened to do a demo the other day in VR <laughs> of a train. I was on a train in virtual reality. So I was on the train. It wasn't coming. Uh -huh. That would be scary. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this sort of Holy grail thing everybody's been swirling around is, are there killer commercial apps for augmented and virtual reality? And the answer is, yep, but the technology is not going to do it all by itself. So after you get done with cool things like training simulations, mm. are there any things that are more like a real-time application? So imagine I'm looking at, say, a construction site. They're building a big skyscraper. Something goes wrong. I, I could put on an augmented reality headset, and all of a sudden just – look at the scene and I might get data uh, from, uh, you know, how much power is being used here? Is the power working? Uh, how much water is in the, uh, you know, those tanks over there? How many people are on this job site? Well, you might know that by just sampling all the cell phone signals. And it's not because they badged in. It's literally just how many humans are there. It might be people that don't have badges. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, are the construction cranes on, all sorts of interesting things that if you've got all that data, again, into a uniform way with a uniform access method, that could be piped like a fire hose into the, uh, no pun intended, so that the safety workers, you know, it could be the police, the fire department, and just stare at the scene and see all that data. And as you turn your head, the data changes with the scene. Um, the speed at which that makes it possible to assess the situation is, is I, I've seen some demos, by the way. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually stunning. Um, and in virtual reality, you can do that, but jump to any place on the world or in space or under the oceans or, you know, sure, in, a, sure. in a mine shaft, you know, places you can't even go uh, very easily. And um, by kind of bringing all the data, it's a never ending trove that gets bigger all the time into that world, you know, you can imagine that uh, this is a whole new and really neat way to visualize. Uh, so you're bringing together, you know, that brings together a lot of issues that have to do with connectivity and computer crunching and how does that visualization actually get made and delivered to you right now. But fortunately, the big AR, VR companies um, at the moment, the big tentpole companies are real household names. Mm -hmm. They're throwing, just like the car makers, they're throwing endless money at trying to solve these issues. And uh, honestly, when we started working on Turbine, neither of those things was in our thought process at all. And now, wow, they are really becoming mm -hmm. important. And so I can tell you that we're actually either in dialogues with or actually doing something with uh, the biggest, these tentpole companies working on AR and VR and most of the car companies, um, and it's really cool and exciting. Yeah, no, I agree. That does sound cool and exciting. Now, now let me ask you a question, um, more business oriented. So we've talked about the we've talked about the users, and we haven't talked about the buyers yet. But this might tie it into it. But are you looking at having people actually companies provide data to your to your store, or is it going to be focused on this uh, publicly available data? Excellent question. So uh, phase one uh, is, you know, make sure we built something robust and scalable. And, uh, you know, a lot of time and energy has gone into that. The new thing is, okay, let's test it in battle. And that's publicly available data. Now, it turns out that uh, particularly the augmented reality and virtual reality guys mm -hmm. love the publicly available data. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, the panoply of it is so broad and deep that, you know, they're just finding it a tremendous store, if you will. It's sort of like walking mm. in a Walmart if you've never seen anything but a little mm. st tiny store before. Um, so they're really loving that and they're going to use it for all sorts of demos and so on. Eventually we will have commercial data. And so the commercial data is coming through, you know, a pretty long process of business development with major companies to, Get them to take that data they've never shared right. and make it available. So all of the uh, work we've done in what we call our policy engine um, has to do with honestly making them happy. You know, it's, uh, well, how do I know who got that? And how do I know, uh, you know, well, this data I wouldn't mind giving free to a university or this data I have to give through obligation to a government agency. But this data I never want my competitor to at least directly get their hands on. And so this whole idea of, policy controls and sort of sender receiver credentialing is very complicated. Um, and we also are realistic about being, you know, essentially a, a, a new company. Sure. You know, we're not going to go tell the IT departments of all the big companies in the world, Hey, just implement this. So we obviously have to conform to whatever they tend to be using now with a big exception. Uh, the big exception is that, uh, we haven't found any large company who said no to blockchain. We found a lot who say no to Bitcoin, but we've found general acceptance of mm -hmm, blockchain mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. a way to essentially guarantee that the sender and receiver are known and, and uh, credentialed. And we have a unique ID, if you will, of a transaction in all of history. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm not sure I fully answered your question, though. So the, the issue on the commercial side is... Many, many companies and many, many industries will, uh, you know, hopefully eventually be willing to put their data in. Um, one thing I will mention, and it's a strategic decision we made, is we don't want any information about people 
uh, what they call PII, personal identifying sure. information. We avoid it sure. like the plague. Uh, yeah. We also don't want any photographs. So uh, we're very happy to let Google and Facebook take the brunt of all those issues around the world, especially in Europe. They're just pinging back on Google Street View and you name it. Um, that, even the cows. Even the cows. That's. Right. Do you read about that? <laughs> no. So I just saw it today. It was really funny. You just you just reminded me of it. But um, they, you know how they how Google Street View kind of blurs out the face of people. Yes. <laughs> they did it with this cow. Anyway, I just thought it was funny. Well, you know, <laughs> I'll tell you what. Uh, some cows are really very private. <laughs> and, uh, or some were really ugly. I don't know. Maybe it was one. Or, maybe it was a combination of the two. It's but sorry, like, so, the cow must have looked like a person. He's blurred. It's, out. Bizarre. it's the AI. Uh, um, that, so that's, you're saying uh, that's uh, computerized uh, cattle mutilation. So um, <laughs> no pictures, no videos. I'm assuming. Yeah, same guys that might have blown up a rocket recently, according to the uh, PR. So I think that's interesting. Um, that uh, we start out saying, no, no, we don't want any photographs or video. But uh, right. another thing that's cropped up since we started working on this, and uh, it's actually really interesting and, and potentially very exciting, is that people who do take photographs, uh, these are satellite companies and people tapping into traffic cameras and all sorts of things like that that capture lots and lots of imagery, are starting to do uh, – Exactly what you just mentioned, you know, they use it to blur a face or Facebook uses it to tag somebody. What these guys are starting to do is say, you know, I'm not sure the pictures are actually all that valuable, even from space. Um, But what would be valuable is to scan those images and figure out how many containers are in that shipping port Mm -hmm. right now. How many cars are in Times Square? How many, you know, how many whatevers? And uh, crop intrusion where you look down from space and see through ultraviolet imaging that this crop is intruding on this crop. And so all of those eventually lead to alphanumerical outputs and they tend to be, you know, what's called time series data and or uh, geolocated data. So or both. What's that? Or the combination of both. Or the combination of both. Yeah, absolutely. And so taking those as outputs that do fit the not only the yeah. formats that we can ingest mm-hmm. into turbine, oh, but like the it. paradigm that we are not about finding out about humans uh, is really perfect, and the timing is tremendous. So we are actually in discussions with a lot of those companies already, and um, most have found us, which is pretty cool, realizing they don't actually have a sales force for that particular kind of output. Um, and <laughs> if hopefully the right marketplace comes along, they do have a sales force. Uh, just built in. So that's a good segue. Um, talk to me about the business model because I can understand you're you're having challenges with with enterprises or corporations that want to make sure if they give you their data, um, their it's their data. Um, they're following all the laws. But now maybe another motivator is to make a bit of money. Is there what's the business model, and is that something that motivates the buyer to or the seller, I should say, to potentially? work with your with turbine absolutely and uh essentially you know by calling it a data marketplace in that name you obviously figure somebody's making money um hopefully and um it's uh two modes if you will initially with publicly available data because we don't have any particular sunk cost for the data other than this ever growing interns fleet of interns yeah they're really uh, (laughs) they're really great though um and some get class credit which is cool so uh, yeah. that, where was that job when I wanted to work at Starbucks in college? No, I get to find sensor data and get paid. So um, what's really interesting about that is that it, very similar to what Michael Bloomberg did when he started his company is we, you know, by getting all that data into one place and it's indexed and it's frictionless and it has an API, um, we know that at some critical mass point, which is coming up very soon, we'll be able to charge blanket subscriptions to get access to the data. Just again, for the sheer act of indexing it and removing friction, mm-hmm. just like Bloomberg did, you know, initially. Mm-hmm. Now, eventually, mm-hmm. like Bloomberg, you say, well, now I got to have stuff that nobody else has. And so in parallel, we're doing business development. And eventually, we're going to have a, a thing we call the dynamic pricing engine. And it will just like a, an exchange, it'll spot price the data. And it could be nice, a nice. set of data or a stream of data. Based on what? 
Uh, well, we've identified uh, 21 factors that would bear mm-hmm. on the price of a data set, and only one oh. is timeliness, which I think is uh, – let me just riff for one second on that. Um, one thing that comes up a lot discussing the Internet of Things, I'm sure you hear this constantly uh, in your position, uh, is that uh, you know a lot of discussion about real time and, oh, my God, we need oh, yeah. standard – we need – you know. Laura, or you know, whatever, all over the place, um, real time, real time, real time, uh, low latency, absolutely. Um, but we did sort of a Pareto analysis, and Pareto, uh, you know, is a uh, an expression referring to what might be commonly called the eighty twenty rule. Mm-hmm. So, a Pareto analysis of use cases that we've spent a huge amount of time on. Uh, tells us that actually very few of the use cases for IoT data are literally real time once you get outside of a closed loop like a manufacturing environment or inside a car. Um, so you'd think that, well, if I'm flying a drone down a street, I definitely need real time data. And the answer is actually mm-hmm. you don't. What you need is mm-hmm. environmental data, mm-hmm. meaning in that case, the word meaning everything going on around you or what might be in front mm-hmm. of you, um, mm-hmm. your environment. And so from yesterday, not necessarily from right now, actually, it could be from a long time ago, uh, like a week or a month, you know, if we're talking about, uh, I need to know where all the power lines are. Okay. It doesn't change that often. The trees, you, you need okay, it to be yeah. reasonably current, but it doesn't have to be updated every millisecond. Um, so, you know, uh, an example also is if I'm trying to do a crop yield forecast, one second's worth of data is useless, but I need three years worth, you know, for a given region. Um, but if I'm trying to turn on the sprinklers, then I need pretty current data. So, again, it bas- it's based on the use case. But to get back to the pricing thing, um, we'd say that about two-thirds of these 21 variables that would impact pricing of a given data set are likely to be in common to any kind of a data marketplace. We're talking about data marketplaces for 3D printing files and mm-hmm. media, music, I mean, all sorts of things that we think will show up as Moore's law progresses and it becomes easier to do a real live data marketplace. On the other hand, uh, about a third of them are very, very specific to sensor data and therefore to the turbine concept. Now the way we uh, intend to make money once that pricing engine is live is we take a percentage of the transaction, just like Mm -hmm. the commodities exchange, like the Chicago mercantile. And uh, how much we take as a percentage and what the general pricing looks like is still up in the air. We're doing – Is it by gig? Is it by bit? Is it – how? what's going to be the metric or the metering metric? Um, the short answer to that is it's probably going to be based more on what the data is, the mm-hmm. volume of the data. And again, that assumes just like – So not volume-based you're saying? Probably not. Uh, there, there's not okay. much evidence that uh, volume would be accepted by a potential buyer. Usually mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. it's really mm-hmm. about access. Another thing about data that's really fascinating is that data, uh, there's no such thing as scarcity. You know, it's not like there's one of these, so you better buy now. It's like, well, no, I can put a song into iTunes and replicate it a billion times, and it it's just bandwidth. And, you know. So the interesting thing about that is, Scarcity is not true in data, but rarity could be true, whereas maybe we're the only place you can go to get that satellite-derived container port, you know, port stuff. So eventually we see that we'll make exclusive deals. Right now that's not in the agenda. We're just making deals. And okay. Uh, okay. we know that these things pass through multiple critical mass points. So Amazon, for example, you know, started out saying we have the biggest book selection ever. And then they started adding other things. Then one day they said, hey, you could take your small store in Peoria and have a massive online presence if you let us front end it. And then eventually they said, hey, we could back end too and we could do your logistics for you. And eventually they said, you know what? The back end's so big, you could just use our back end that has nothing to do with retail at all. And that becomes what, of course, is now the world's largest cloud system, uh, you know, Amazon Web Services. So we're kind of looking at a somewhat similar arc as a business plan, um, except that uh, I don't know if we're going to get to consumers with apps. I think right now this is very, very much a commercial enterprise. 
Well, that, that kind of leads me to my next question. You've mentioned backend and apps. Uh, so the data is going to be accessed, you're also saying, by, by machines. So, so through an API, I'm going to ask you quickly, you know, what's the API? Or I guess I should say, what are, what's going to be the protocol? Is it your own protocol? And secondly, do you envision that this is a streaming, although you kind of implied no, but is this a streaming kind of um, access or is it just accessing a data pool, sucking it up, and then you're done? Those are really good questions. Uh, one, uh, to go back through them, uh, the access is through our, an API that we've developed. Uh, the API is almost entirely an expression of our metadata specification. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. We've run the metadata spec by a lot of interesting companies and people, and uh, the general consensus, which literally was suggested by one of the very large consulting companies, uh, is that we just open source it because things like the Industrial Internet Consortium don't have that. Uh, right. they, they, As you know, they tend to be looking at the lower layer protocols right now, um, which is where they need to be, you know, to get all that started to congeal. But we're looking at the application layer. And so uh, we don't really have any particular marriage or revenue that would come from having a specification. In fact, the more entities use the specification, the better. So at some point, probably not in the too distant future, we're going to just open source it and let everybody have at it. And that's why it's already it's already freely available on our website so that people can look. The other, uh, so then you go to the API. The API is, you know, how we enact that fire hose for input and output. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, you know, and you, you just said it, we don't really see that a human types on a computer and gets at stuff uh, or an app because... In many cases, the volume of what you're doing is going to be way beyond what a a person sitting there could do. And a machine could be a fleet of drones. It could be SAP, you know, all sorts of different things that just need, or Salesforce, you know, you're sort of mapping one API set to the other. And then that leads to um, kind of an entrenchment that's nice. Um, But it also leads to, uh, you know, knowing that uh, the performance issue is kind of out of the equation if it's one machine talking to another. Mm-hmm. Uh, and is it, is it, and I guess so it'll just knock on the door every once in a while or in very rare cases, it sounds like it'll actually have a, a full-time connection that's sucking up the data <laughs> co- constantly. Yeah. Well, forgive me for dev- going under the hood of the car for a second, but it's a restful API. Um, you can just make calls when you need to. Um, you also could push things, uh, but to get to this specific answer, um, as you look at what that means, you know, is it a file or a stream? Well, it really is a stream of files. And uh, so is music streaming, you know, when you really get down to the nuts and bolts of it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like say your video camera is spitting out video. What it's really doing is it opens a file, blasts bits, closes the file, opens another file. Quite often that'll actually happen when you don't even realize it. Um, you know, it's just opening and shutting files all the time. So strictly speaking, none of it is ever really a stream per se. It's just a continually outputting sensor stream, if you will, but it's not a stream in the very strict sense of, say, a phone call. Mm-hmm. Um, now, that there's nothing about our architecture that wouldn't allow true streaming, but since we're not doing things like uh, audio and video, uh, it doesn't really bear on that. It's really a matter of just uh, accessing some some kind of a file. I want to okay. sidebar, because I said audio, um, one of the, uh, and it probably has to do with my background, but one of the areas in sensing that doesn't get enough love, in my opinion, is audio. And there's a really interesting company uh, based in uh, Silicon Valley called ShotSpotter. Uh, uh, yes, I think I know where you're going with this. Go yeah, ahead. so ShotSpotter is exactly a use case for something like Turbine where uh, some bright guys realized, and this, this was a shock to me, I had no idea that traffic cameras at intersections have microphones. In. <laughs> I was literally shocked to hear that. I said, what? You know, so um, they uh, might, you know, the audio is somewhat muzzled, if you will, because it's in a, weatherproof and literally bulletproof housing um, mm. because people love traffic cameras so much. They say, Hey, I'm just going to shoot that thing. 
So yeah. they are in really ruggedized housings, but they have microphones because essentially they're based on, you know, security cameras. And so ShotSpotter uh, realized that nobody was doing anything with that audio. So what they did was to make deals with all the municipalities. I think it's over 100 now. Uh, and what they do is they capture that, do analytics. Now they can mm-hmm. tell you if this report that's coming from microphones in a district of a city is – uh, a car backfiring, it's a Harley without a muffler going by, it's a mm-hmm. trash truck dropped a container, you know, a, a trash bin on the ground, mm-hmm. or it's a gunshot. There we go. Then using Doppler, really clever, sexy math, they figure out roughly where it is, mm-hmm. and then they can tell local law enforcement, and in some cases even the fire department, you know what, that was definitely a shotgun um, I noticed recently in the last season of that show, Person of Interest, an entire episode was dedicated to this exact thing. In fact, they, Is that right? huh. they almost flat out called it Shot Spotter. It was, I don't know why, they were really enamored with that concept. So there's a cross correlative kind of a, application. Mm, I like it. And so I think audio uh, doesn't get enough due. But in the same way that people are taking image analytics and producing alphanumerical outputs, I think audio is going to go the same way, and I think we haven't even begun to see how interesting that'll be. And I, I would argue that is part of the Internet of Things. Um, I agree. It's yeah. not a human interactive type thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're running out of time, and so we're going to have to leave uh, data ownership and legal and regulatory issues aside. But I guess I just want to make two points. Um, the first one, I'm sure happy you say data instead of data. data. <laughs> no, data instead of da- data. Yeah, data. Um, I have my earphones on, so it's kind of like hard to hear myself. Plus, I have a cold, as everyone can probably hear, because it would have been really awkward. I would have been <laughs> saying data. You would have been saying data. And number two, I'm a big fan of, of what you guys are doing. Why? Because this is one of the biggest differentiators of how you differentiate a Internet of product, an Internet of Things product with a connected product. And that is connecting up to other sources of data, not data, but data. Yep. And I think once you guys wrestle this to the ground, there's, there, there is a lot of uh, gold in them there hills. So, David, why don't you uh, let our listeners know where they can find out more about you and your company? Certainly. Uh, first of all, uh, I've been a while ago invited to write uh, a column for the big magazine, Computer World. It's sort of the most... Venerable magazine in the computer industry. I think it's been around for 40 or 50 years. And uh, I write their blog called IoT Watch. So if you just go to computerworld.com. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. Okay. And, uh, well, we're going to put all this in the show analysis notes. Yes, and I will even put this show in there. And uh, so it's because uh, uh, I think this is a, a great thing. So we also have um, uh, the ha- I'm also the Twitter handle is IoT Curator. Just to mm-hmm. just clearly put the label on the box. Uh, turbine is with an E, so it's T E R B I N E dot com. And through that, you can, uh, we have a pretty neat two minute video that tells you a lot about the concept and does mention all those things like policy and, and so on. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we also have the pilot test front end that I keep mentioning, and that's turbine.io. But yeah, you can also surf to that directly through the dot com, so it's it's pretty easy. Because remember, we're all about removing friction and transactions. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I, I, when I do, when I used it last night, I didn't even know I was using it. It was so friction. It was so frictionless. <laughs> <laughs> all right, David, thanks for the time. I appreciate it, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right, thanks very much. Okay, that was a good talk with David Knight. This podcast goes vertical deep diving into different topics each week. If you prefer a more horizontal and structured approach to learning IoT business and its orbiting technologies, check out my book IoT Inc., published by McGraw-Hill, or become a certified IoT professional by completing the ICIP training and certification program. For details, just go to www.iot-inc.com. Also go to www.iot-inc.com for an analysis of this episode, links to things that were mentioned during the episode, and very importantly, the episode's PDF transcript. Just search for the name of the episode or the guest. If you're new to this podcast, subscribe. That way you'll get every week's episode delivered straight to your device. 
Or, if you've been listening for a while, there are three ways you can support the show. You can leave a rating or a review on iTunes. Just go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes. It only takes one click to leave a rating, a little bit longer to leave a review. You can share it on social. I'm on LinkedIn, to a lesser extent, on Twitter. And of course, you can support the show by buying my book, IoT Inc., or the ICIP Training and Certification Program. That's how I pay the bills. Next week's episode is Dirty Data, Preventing the Pollution of Your IoT Data Lake with James Brannigan of Brightwolf. I hope you can join me then. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Until next week, may your path to IoT business be a data-driven one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show.